Good morning. Um, we haven't been together in a long time. Uh, sorry about that, but VBS kind of took over and definitely had to get that done before I could get back on this. So um, I'm excited that VBS is done, but we had a great, great time. And if you wanted to see some of the pictures, you need to check out his very first assemblies page because they were amazing. Um, we're going to go ahead and pray and get back into Genesis. So, Lord, we just lift up this time. I just ask that you bless it. I pray that you would... Um, help your message to go out and I pray that I would rightly be able to share your word in Jesus name amen okay so we are in Genesis 19 and we are going to start with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed so the two angels if you remember there were angels that had went and visited Abraham and um, those two angels or two angels in the Lord when it visited Abraham and told them about how they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham pleaded for the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then God said, yes, he would not. He would spare the city or he would spare those that were righteous. So now we're at Sodom and Gomorrah. And the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up and got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Okay, so Lot was sitting in the gateway. Oh, let me turn me in a little crooked here. Okay, so Lot was sitting in the gateway. So although much of what he saw and heard bothered him in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, Lot was still willing to tolerate Sodom's sinfulness in order to experience the social and material advantages of living in the big city. And I, I think that really pertains to us because we definitely will sacrifice what we believe is right for the pleasures of living in a good place or being able to do, you know, what we want to do. And the moral compromise brought tragedy to his family. And in the same way, Believers today who recklessly explo expose their families to ungodly environments and evil influences for social or material gain are setting themselves up for family tragedies. And I have to admit, that is a, definitely a, a true statement. Um, when my family was living here in Victorville, Back in 2003 and 2004, when, right when we moved, um, we, my husband and I were both working full-time jobs, and uh, my kids were getting ready to become teenagers, and we moved to a small town called Ridgecrest from Victorville. Now, Victorville was a bigger city than Ridgecrest, and um, my kids definitely did not... Uh, avoid trouble. My kids kind of ran to trouble. But being in a smaller city, the trouble they got in was nowhere near the size of the trouble that they could have got in had we stayed in the bigger city. And I really truly believe that God had his hand on that because if we would have stayed here, I think we would have lost my kids. So sometimes the sacrifices we have to make for living what's right and doing what's right outweigh the pleasures and the conveniences of what we are living in and around and we have to do those sacrifices for a family for our kids we want to make sure that what we're doing and what we're exposing our families and our kids to is not a detriment to their eternal salvation you know nothing's worth that right nothing's worth sacrificing your eternal salvation for and um Unfortunately, that's where Lot was. Lot was willing to sacrifice where his family lived for the creature comforts of living in the big city. And um, that's where he failed. So let's see where we pick up now. Okay. Oh. Okay. I'm crocheting while I do this, so... Bear with me here. Okay. So let's see. And then we see back in chapter 13, verses 12 and 13, how 
he had did this initially when Abraham and him were talking, um, when they separated. It says that Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And it wasn't like he didn't know this. When he pitched his tents there, he knew that. But it was a great city. It was a big place. He wasn't having to live in the plains and in the tents and in the desert. He got to live in the big city. And sometimes when you sacrifice that, that's what, you, that's what happens. So that's where we're at. Okay, so now we go back to chapter 19. And in verse 2. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. That's a bad idea. Why would that be a bad idea to spend the night in the square? It's like, oh no, we'll just sleep on the street. Yeah, probably not a good idea to sleep on the streets of a big city. Yeah. So, but he myth, he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And he prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Yeah, so they were just... The men of the city wanted to sexually abuse the male strangers. And it's where the word Sodom comes from. Um, we see that the Bible refers to homosexual acts and lust as condemned in the Bible. Okay, he's condemning the act. He's not condemning the person. God loves all people. God offered salvation to everyone. God is willing that none should perish, but that all would have eternal life. But the act, that homosexual act, he does condemn. And we see it in Leviticus 20, verse 13, where it says, Leviticus 20, verse 13, If a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both, of it, both have done a detestable, both have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Okay, so he's not mincing words here. He's saying that this is a detestable act. He's saying that if you choose to do this detestable act, that it's on you. It's your choice. He's not forcing you, but he's saying that it's not a right thing to do. Okay, but don't, don't, don't lose it here because we're going to find some other scriptures that compare all sin as being equal. So we have 1 Corinthians 6, 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, the slanderers, the swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's not just the homosexual. It is greedy people, drunk people, idolaters. The idolatry is not necessarily just a little golden statue. If you idolize your job, if you idolize your kids, if you idolize your spouse, this is what you're opening the door to. It's the same thing. It's the same sin. God is not saying that he hates these people. God is saying he hates the sin. And that is the difference. God loves people. God hates sin. God can't look on sin. And sin is what separates us from him. That's why he hates it, because he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to be able to come to him, but we can't come to him when we have that sin in our lives. All right, and the last scripture we have is Romans 127. Romans 127 says, In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. 
men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their per perversion. Okay, so it's human rebellion, right? And it's corruption and self-indulgence. And it's the same as any sin, any greed, any lying. It's rebellion against God. It's people rejecting and defying God's pattern for behavior and consequently being allowed by God to go their own way. God loves us, and, but he doesn't force himself on us. He gives us free will. And that's the, that's the awesomeness of being in a relationship with our God, is that he doesn't hate you for what you're doing. He hates the sin that is separating us from him. And um, failing to depend on God and refusing to follow his way results in many other forms of ungodly behavior that are just as equally detestable to God. Just like we talked about, greed and gossip and arrogance and disobedience to parents. It's all rebellion against God. And God is not saying he doesn't love us. Good morning, Alicia. God is not saying he doesn't love us. God is saying he hates the sin that separates us from him. And in God's view, sin is sin, and it's all represented as defiance against him. So what do we need at that point? <clears throat> God is saying that, we ha do we have a personal relationship with him? He's saying, are you able to, A, admit that you're a sinner, admit that you've sinned, admit that one of those things is you and that it's a problem in your life? And then believe, believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And see, confess that he is the one that is able to save you from your sin. Those are the ABCs that we always talk about. But why? Because they're, they're the foundation of us coming back to God. God is saying that he loves us, but he can't love the sin in us. And he loves us enough to not leave us in the sin we're in, but to transform us hence the word, transform us from where we were to where we can be. And that's what the power of God does. The power of God oversees all, overlooks all the sin once we come to him. Our sin is as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't look at our sin anymore. Once we confess our sin to God, he forgives us and restores us and brings us into a right relationship with him. But we have to come to him first. We have to come to him and say, and acknowledge that we have sinned. And see, that's the hardest part. We don't want to say we sinned. We want to justify. We want to make excuses. We don't want to say we're wrong. We want to say we're fine. And if you want to continue to say you're fine, that's your choice. God loves you, but he can't look on the sin in our lives. And your sin is no different than my sin. It is no different than anybody else's sin. Sin is sin. So... Let's take us back to where we were in Genesis 19, okay? Okay, so they wanted to have sex with them. So now we're in verse 6 of 19, chapter 19 of Genesis. Lot went outside to meet them and said, meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do with them. You can do what you would like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Okay, so now not only is he sitting at the gate of the city, allowing those um, bad influences in his life and the lives of his family, not only is he in a situation now that these evil influences are wanting to um, attack his family and those that are under the protection of his family. Now he's willing to sacrifice his family for the creature comforts of this city, okay? And we hope, the commentary at the bottom it says, it's difficult to believe that he would willingly allow his da daughters to be defiled and abused. Um, perhaps he was stalling. Perhaps he was hoping that they would come to their senses. Um, I think he 
honestly saw his daughters just like the world saw them at this point. Women were not looked upon as precious in God's sight at that point in time. Men held a higher regard in the realm of things as opposed to women. And he didn't see his women as a valued possession. He didn't see his daughters as a valued possession. He just saw them as a commodity that he could offer to these people. And um, that's what happens when the world jades our thinking and jades our thoughts and jades what we should really see as, as right. When we lose track of what is right and what is wrong, we don't see things as how God values them. We see them how the world values them. And we lose track of what the value of things are in our lives. So that's where he was at. So now they're saying, get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. And they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Okay, so, but the men inside reached out, pulled Lot back into the house, and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so they could not find the door. And the two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place. The outcry of the Lord against this, its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Now, God does love people, but when we continually refuse to obey God and we, we live in a point of rebellion against God and not wanting anything that has to do with them, there comes a point when God has to discipline us, just like we have to discipline our kids. You know, we love our kids, but there comes a point when they're, what they're doing is so wrong, it's so grievous, it's not okay that we have to step in and give them guidance on what they need to do and what they don't need to do and Sodom and Gomorrah was going to have to be an example to those cities around them that they couldn't continue down the path of what this city was doing that they needed to change their ways so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters he said hurry Get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-laws thought he was joking. Okay. So when the com with the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot. Now remember, they came in the evening. It was just evening when they got there. This whole thing, they have been there all night. And Lot has still not got out of the city. He's not in any hurry. He's still dawdling around in the city. He couldn't get his sons-in-laws to agree or, or even understand what he was saying because they were evil. They didn't believe him. They didn't trust him. They didn't know his God. He was not an influence in their lives. So if those around you are not influenced by who you are or what you are doing, you need to reevaluate what you're doing because maybe you're not being the influence God has called you to be in people's lives. The angel said, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And when he hesitated, so he's not hurrying, right? He's hesitating. When, they hes when he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. Why? Because Abraham had pleaded, for the righteous of the city, because the Lord was not going to destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. God was going to save those who had a relationship with him, and Lot did have a relationship with God. But that relationship with God did not transfer over to his family or to those he knew around them. It was his own saving faith. He didn't have faith enough to share with those around him. Okay? So... As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant, If your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains, 
This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a small town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me, let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. So he's still not wanting to live without the creature comforts of being in a city. He's not willing to trust God and live on the plains and live in the desert places. Why? Because he, his faith is just not that big. His faith is like, I can't do this. I can't. He, if he would have realized, no, I can't do this, but through God I can. But that's not where he was at. So they said, he said to them, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. And that is why the town was called Zor. So by the time the lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. And then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from, out, from, from the Lord out of the heavens and thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So let's look at that. Let's look at that. 1928, Lot's wife. Okay, so did not take the angels specific command seriously she obviously didn't take the command seriously or she wouldn't have looked back right um she had a fond attachment to sodom she was maybe she was curious to witness god's judgment if we're attached to or take pleasure in the world's corrupt system we're going to experience god's wrath and the destruction that awaits ungodly people it is our choice whether we allow ourselves to be uh, influenced by the world around us. We don't have to allow ourselves to be influenced, but if we choose to allow ourselves to be influenced, then we can't blame God when things befall us because of what we've allowed in our lives. God doesn't force us to allow sin in our lives. God doesn't want us to allow sin in our lives, but it's our choice. And if that's our choice, he's going to allow us to suffer the consequences of our choice, just like a good parent allows their child to suffer the consequences of their sin. Why? Because that's how they learn, right? And if that learning experience meant that it cost the mother her life, then hopefully it would have been a learning experience for the rest of the family, right? Well, unfortunately, we're going to see that it wasn't a learning experience for the rest of the family. They didn't take heed to what God had done by allowing the mother to die the way she did. They just didn't even acknowledge it. It doesn't even say anything about what they thought about it. So hopefully our lives mean more to others than absolutely no comment <laughs> if our lives were taken, you know. Um, hopefully you have a bigger impact than that. Okay, so early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So we see that that smoke from a furnace is an example of what is going to happen to all who defile God. And the New Testament warns that the final day of God's wrath is approaching when there will be smoke like that coming from a furnace in the final days there will be people dying and there will be destruction why because we've allowed the world's influences to take over our lives if we are the righteous of course god will save the righteous god will bring us out but are we having an influence on those around us to save all those around us or are they going to just think we're joking do they not even acknowledge that we really have a relationship with God? Do they really believe what we're saying? Or do they just think we're, we're a joke? Where's your walk? Where's your witness? Be who God's called you to be. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain and remembered, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot lived. Okay, so for the sake of Abraham, 
for the righteousness of Lot, he saved him and his family as much that choose that chose to be saved. His daughters chose to be saved. They chose to follow what the angel said. His wife did not. And God is not going to force us to be saved. God's going to allow us, if we choose to not be saved, he's going to allow us to turn around and be turned into that pillar of salt. Why? Because it's our choice. It's not God's design. It's our choice. What is your choice today? How are you influencing the choices of those around you by being a, a light and being what you need to be in their lives to witness to them, right? Okay. Now we're getting on to the next part, which is a little more even worse. So we have Lot and his daughters. So Lot and his daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains. Okay, so now he, he can't even live in this city, right? For he was afraid to stay in Zor. Why? Probably because the people of that town had heard about what happened and really didn't want anything to do with him being in their town. So he and his two daughters lived in a cave. And one day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father drunk. Let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. Okay, so now we see that they got their father to drink wine. So they committed the sin of incest. You're not supposed to sleep with your family members. That's not okay. And Lot committed the sin of drunkenness. Both were choices, right? God didn't force either one of them to do what they did. They chose to do it. So one, growing up around the sin and ungodliness of the Sodomites, whom Lot tolerated, made his daughters adopt very low moral standards, right? They were reckless. They had reckless tolerance for ungodly behavior. He lost his family and his descendants to become pagans. Pagans are people that don't follow God. So because of his lack of sharing the gospel, sharing God with his family, he lost his entire heritage, his children, his grandchildren. He lost all that. Why? Because he didn't share God with them. He could have shared God with them. He chose not to. He chose the creature comforts of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah over sharing God with his family. And two, Lot's an example of a believing father whose faith and commitment may have been just enough to save himself, but not enough to influence or save his family. True faith involves teaching one's family to avoid and resist the world's evil influences. We are called, as Christians, not just to save ourselves, but to save those around us. God has given you a family that you should be sharing God's love with. Not God's condemnation, God's love, God's provision, God's benevolence. Yes, God is a God of justice. God is a God of wrath. But those are the last resort things. God has held off the last day for all to come to repentance. God desires that none should perish, but that all would have eternal life. He's waiting for all those that we know that don't know him to come to him. Why? Because he's long suffering. He doesn't want any to perish, but it is our job to influence our family and those around us for God. It is not enough that we have saving faith to save ourselves but that we don't care anything about the family around us. That's not what salvation's all about. Salvation is that we share God with those around us so that all can come to repentance, that all could be saved. All right, we're almost to the end. Here we go. So that night, they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and lay with him, and he was not aware of it. And when she lay down or when she got up, and the next day the older daughter said to the younger, last night I lay with my father, let's get him to drink wine again tonight. And you go in and lie with him so that we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also. And the younger daughter went and lay with him. 
and again he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab, and he is the father of the Moabites. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He was the father of the Ammonites. Both the Moabites and the Ammar Ammonites were evil. Evil people in the sight of God had no desire or relationship with God. And they were constantly fighting with the Israelites and constantly causing them to have either be put into slavery or killing them. Always at war. Always at war. God does preserve a Moabite. We see Ruth later on in the Bible who was a Moabite who chose God over her country, over the Moabites. She chose to follow God instead of following what the Moabites did. And God redeemed her. And she is in the lineage of Jesus. So we see that God doesn't allow those that don't know him to never come to him, but they have to, they have to leave the evil that they're from and choose what God is offering them in order to be saved. So that's where we're at with that. You know, it's amazing that stories like this are in the Bible. If you've never heard these stories, they're amazing, but God is doing an amazing thing as well today. God is, is trying to reach out to those around us God is trying to use any and every situation to show that he loves people. He hates sin. There is so many examples of this in the media today. God loves people. God hates sin. Are we showing that to those around us today? Or are we condemning the sin of those around us? Because their sin is no different than our own. We can't point fingers at others' sin. That's not what this is designed to do. It's designed to show us I am no more worthy than anybody else. God loves me just like he loves the sinners around me. And I'm a sinner too. But the only difference is I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I see that I have this sin, I can take it to my Lord and I can ask for forgiveness. And that's what he's offering us today. That's what he's offering us today when we say, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your personal savior? It's the only thing that has any eternal value. Do you know Jesus as your personal savior? God's whole purpose is that we would have eternal life. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. God desires that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you to perish. God loves you. God hates all of our sin, not just your sin, all of our sin, my sin, everyone's sin. God hates sin. And that's why he sent his son to die for our sin. We're already forgiven for the sin. We just have to ask for that forgiveness. What's our problem? We have to admit that we're sinners. A, admit that we're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No specific person's sin is any more worse than another. Sin is sin. Jesus died for all sin from then, now, and that we'll commit later on. Jesus already died for that sin and has already forgiven us. We just have to ask for forgiveness. So what's God's solution? B, to believe in Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one should come to the Father but through me. God is saying that he loves us and he's given us a solution. God's given us the way to heaven and it's Jesus Christ. What's your personal response? C, we need to confess our faith. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have to confess with your mouth. You have to say Jesus is Lord. You have to admit that Jesus has, is your Savior. And then you have to believe in your heart that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And then we have a prayer. A prayer that's not any special words. Just you praying, Jesus, I've sinned. Forgive me of my sin. You are God's son. Thanks for making me a child of God. 
Give me your Holy Spirit so that I can confess my faith. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is asking that we would just come to him and ask for forgiveness. So what now? What now? What do we do now? So what do we do? Be. Be sharing. Tell people about Jesus. We need to be sharing God's love with others. It's not enough that we have salvation, but we need to share that salvation with other people. Be praying. It helps you to grow close to God. Be in prayer. Talk to God. Tell him what you have going on. What's going on? What sin is in your life that you need forgiveness for? And we need to be reading. Be reading the word to get to know who God is. We find out who God is through his word and we talk to God when we pray. We need to be involved. We need to be in a church to help us grow and to be a help to other people. It's not all about us. We need to grow when we go to church, but we also need to serve when we go to church. So that's where we're at. God has given us today as a new day. What are you going to do with today? Be who God's called you to be. Share God's love with those around you. Let your life be an impact that someone will be impacted by your life and it will change their life for eternity. And I pray that you would have a blessed day and that you would learn what, take what you've learned today and share it with others and let it impact your life. Thanks so much.